Uh, welcome to this week's graphics programming virtual meetup. Uh, we follow the Berlin Code of Conduct for our, our, for our little meetup group. We have a Discord, which you can ask for others for the link, or you can type that in, what you see right there. And we have a Twitter, which you should follow. And this week's, we are covering lesson eight of the Tiny Renderer series. In fact, are the last lesson we will be covering. It covers ambient occlusion. So here's a link to the tutorial and a link to my code. I have yet to put up the code, which is keeps happening, but I'll, I'll get it up there eventually. So ambient lighting. What is ambient lighting as opposed to direct or indirect or whatever? Well, in our abstract, simplified, to the point of not being very accurate model, uh, we refer to ambient lighting as the lighting which comes from everywhere rather than from a specific source or sources, set of sources. And it's really used to make sure that the scene has some light at all times, even if there possibly shouldn't be due to uh, distant lighting, lighting and effects. Uh, in the Fong model, there is an ambient term, and that's really hacky because it's a single value that's the same across the entire surface. It's constant. It doesn't change with re respect to anything, which is not how light works. Light has all sorts of dynamicity. It's not a single constant value. But it worked well when performance was limited enough that you couldn't do anything other than have a single constant term. So that's why Fong used that back in the 70s. But we are no longer in the 70s and we can do better. So we want to have a ambient term that is not constant across the surface. We want it to be able to be variable across the surface. Now, it's easy to imagine the ambient light a surface receives as just a fat a product or not a product specifically but a um, ratio between how open or how closed the surface is a trench or a crevice gets very little light at the bottom whereas a peak a tower a, a very large bump the top of the bump will get all sorts of light because it has light coming in from all directions you know rather than a trench or will have which only has light coming in from the very top. So in a lot of ways, ambient light is a measure of how open to the space or to the rest of the area that segment is. So one way we can model this is to simply figure out if a polygon is visible from any random point. And we can do this using a very brute force method. So first we're going to assume we have a hemisphere. We're going to assume our objects are being lit by hemispheres, not by spheres, but half of a sphere, the top half. And this is to model like a sky or how most things are in an environment where the, the bottom is, is the floor has to sit on something. It's not, there's not lights underneath an object. So now that we have our hemisphere, we're going to pick a thousand random points on it. A thousand sounds like a lot, but in practice, it's a very small number for what we're doing. Anyways, we take these points and then we draw a shadow map from that point. So we basically take a random direction on the hemisphere and create a depth buffer from it. And that depth buffer is our shadow map. Then we then we accumulate all of those disparate shadow maps into a single UV map to represent the actual accumulated texture or accumulated ambient values. So we can see here we have the points on the hemisphere. It's only the top half. Um, a fun little fact of trivia is not trivia. A fun little exercise is trying to create random points on a hemisphere. It's not as simple as just doing a latitude longitude because the latitude and longitude are not um, the sing it will it will generate points collecting near the top and the, the the poles because that's how latitude and longitude work if you choose a random number in that. But anyway, I digress. So if we 
let's 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 assume we have a random point on the surface here and we generate the shadow map from that point it looks something like this if we take the output of the shadow map and map it onto the texture the uv a, a newly created texture that is going to be our uv texture um, this will be our ambient map actually but as you look around we can see the different parts of the model it's consistent with the uv mapping of the model we're using and while it may not be present thanks to compression uh, this is not a gradient map it is a hard on or off map and what this is representing is the well the mapping of a screen space coordinate to a, a 2d space one where we're if the model is a far distance away the screen space all of those points on the screen space will be very uh, spread out across the model. Whereas if the model's up close, there'll be a lot of screen space coordinates mapping to the model UV coordinates. Anyways, this is what one light's occlusion would see. And if we do it for a thousand points and then accumulate into this map, we get something that looks like a grayscale map rather than it being a single binary value of is it visible or not. And so that's really powerful because as you can see the surface has a gradient across of, across it and we can see where the surfaces were more visible and less visible as we can see the top of the arm is very visible um, from the entire scene whereas certain segments like right here and over here and here they were on the bottom sides of you know what the leg or the arm or whatever and so they got very little light proportionally if we then sample from it as if it was a regular texture, we get something that looks like this. So this would be what our our non-constant ambient texture looks like. As if you look at the underside of the hands, the bottom of the legs, the underside of the face, everything that is on the bottom is very unlit, whereas things on the front and on the top gets a lot of light, relatively speaking because it had an entire hemisphere casting onto it instead of a half a hemisphere or very little of a hemisphere, which is the case of everything on the bottom. So, well, we have a way to do ambient occlusion, but is it any good? <laughs> In short, no. It's a nice solution if you don't mind taking eons and eons because you're having to generate thousands of shadow maps to actually get this map for a single model. Not only that, it only applies to a hemisphere, which means that the ambient values will always look like it was in a hemisphere, even if, it's, even if the model's in a scene where there is no sky or there is no global lighting that comes from a hemisphere. And on top of that, this method, it uses the UV space we recycled it from the model, which means that if there is parts of the model that have been mirrored, as in the arms are sharing UV coordinates or the legs, are, you know, there's, if there's a symmetry on it, the uh, ambient values will be reflected across it, even if they shouldn't be for whatever reason. And that can cause issues because it, you're, you're using a map that was not meant to hold global information. It was only meant to hold uh, information that the UV texture, texture UVs were meaning to sample from. So global illumination isn't, this form, not global illumination, this ambient occlusion technique is, well, not used in a real-time setting. Instead, a lot of people opt to use well, pre-calculated uh, ambient maps. So artists will sometimes create an ambient map and physically paint on, okay, these are the dark and these are the light sections, usually in crevices and nooks and crannies. But an even simpler way to get ambient occlusion data is to generate it on the fly using screen space. And so screen space ambient occlusion is a very popular technique that uses the depth buffer to figure out 
whether a pixel is going to be light or dark based off an ambient lighting value. And it does this by looking at the surrounding neighborhood of pixels around uh, the pixel in question. So here's some code to do it. The problem, the first step of an screen space ambient occlusion technique is to get a depth buffer. We cannot calculate the ambient values if we don't already know what the depth values are around the pixel in question. So we first have to march through the scene and figure out the depth values. This is no also this step is known as this, the depth prepass and it's very common in big game engines because it's the depth value depth buffer is useful for a lot of things and having it ready to go at the very beginning of your you know, frame rendering is very handy. But we can look through it and see that the shader is our normal projection model view, multiple, a matrix multiplication, and we set the varying try so that when the fragment shader runs, it can get the data it needs, except when the fragment shader runs, nothing actually happens. This whole function could, could be done without the fragment or this varying try or anything of that sort in, an, in a in a GPU API context, you would simply omit the fragment shader in this for to do this kind of thing. But since our architecture doesn't really allow that, we don't do that, and all the actual depth writing happens in the triangle function, which we do not have code for right here. So now that we have that, and this, this would be the code that runs that shader, we can use that to figure out the depth value. This this whole thing is what does the screen space ambient inclusion, except for this function here, which is not listed in the tutorial, but is simple enough that I can explain it. So instead of looking at code, I'm going to go to the algorithm and then sh uh, go back and forth between the code and the algorithm. So for each pixel in the image, and this is what height and width does over here, we want to emit rays emit going outwards from that pixel in what I'm calling UV space, i.e. the 2D image, the depth buffer specifically. So up, down, left, right, all the combinations of those. In the algorithm we're doing, we only do eight rays, as in the, the four cardinal directions and the four diagonals from that pixel. So along each ray, we're going to go out a couple of pixels, maybe five or six, and we're going to see which, uh, we're going to find the slope between each pixel that we're marching along the ray, and then record the slope. And if the slope is greater than the, the previous current largest slope, we keep track, we replace it with the current, now new current largest slope. In effect, we march along the ray and say, okay, we found that this ray has a slope of, a maximum slope of 45 degrees or 30 degrees or 66 degrees. And we do this along each ray and then we maximize, max all of those out. And I will actually not max, we, uh, we uh, accumulate all of those values and divide by eight to get the average maximum slope at that pixel. What this gives us is a measurement of how hilly that area is. So if we go out and find that there's a lot of slopes between all of the pixels, then we are in an area that's likely in a crevice. But if we keep marching out and there's no slope change, that means we're in a flat area and that there isn't anything occluding or anything in, you know, causing a crease or a fold or any blocking geometry, at least in screen space. And so we take that value and that is our that is our ambient value. So here in the if statement, we just make sure that we actually have some have a depth value to compute if it's the max depth or min depth, I should say. Then we don't have a surface in which to compute on, so we should just ignore it. So here is our total, and this is our function that goes in all the directions, but instead of it's going in a cardinal directions, it's using a, um, a circle <laughs> where it's 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 in radians. This a is so it's starting from zero and going to 
2 pi minus a little bit for uh, just rounding and it's going in quarter steps. So instead of going plus x minus x plus y minus y, it's just increasing the angle. So our total value here is the addition of this function, max elevation angle, which we pass in our depth buffer, we pass in our current point, our x, y, and we pass in our, well, direction based off the angle in which we can compute because the, uh, the thanks to trigonometry, cosine of A would be our x and our sine of A would be our y value along the unit circle. And so that's our direction and max elevation angle will march along that ray that we've defined from x, y to uh, the direction here. And then we want to subtract 2 pi over it because it's an angle, because it's getting the elevation angle, not the uh, not a number between zero and one. So then we need to account for the two pi times eight to get rid of the fact that we are we did it eight times. So we're dividing by the number multiplied by eight. The pow here is not anything to do with screen space. That is just to make it visible to the user. In it would, it's already a number between zero and one, as the division here would do. And then we just set that out so they could see it. So this is a this would be considered a post processing effect, and we treat it as such because instead of doing a whole bunch of um, trying a, a bunch of geom, we're not drawing a bunch of geometry. Instead, we're just iterating over the pixels in the screen and then writing to our frame buffer at, at those pixels. And the final result is this well somewhat creepy face, where the mouth, the eyes, the ear, the um, underneath the, sh the neck are all dimmer than the surrounding areas that are very flat, like the, the neck itself, the forehead, the cheek, the chin. Um, and so that's SSAO. The, there are some problems with SSAO in that it doesn't really consider local space it's all screen space so if you have distant geometry and nearby geometry the, you have to have an ssao technique that handles it it is still a hack it's really just multiplying the color values by a term that says hey this should be darker this should be lighter it doesn't actually compute global illumination unlike our first solution which kind of does do global illumination even if really really poorly the the brute force attempt that is so for fun we have the inverse of it i'm not sure how well it shows up but this is the demon character and where there uh it's it's where there is a lot of slope the white is put into the depth buffer and where there is little slope it isn't so we get some nice outlines where the horn is means there's a big discontinuity between the face and the horn and that's an indication of one of the limitations the horn and the face might be really distant and so they're in a real sense there isn't the occlusion there as strong but in our because of ssao it's very strong so the code for it is online. You can find out how to do it through there. There's plenty of other SSAO tutorials. This is not the only way to do it. And in fact, there's a lot of ways to improve it, to make it faster, to make it more good looking. But suffice to say, that is what she wrote. So that's the end of the tiny, tiny render tutorial series. As far as we're going to take it, there is another chapter, chapter nine, that we are not covering because it is literally OpenGL code not tiny software rasterizing and it kind of makes a little sense to cover that not to mention it's OpenGL 2 mostly uh, and uses glut and I don't even know if you can get it to compile on a modern machine without much consternation so I'm not even gonna bother trying um, I've done my my share of OpenGL 2 stuff I'm not going back if I at all can help it so instead I have a short list of things that you can try doing with the software rasterizer one of the things I'd like to try to do, but no promises, is to have some form of hardware acceleration. Currently, we're single-threaded, uh, floating-point-only calculations. What if we added multiple threads where we you know, calculate the parts of the image in parallel? What if we added intrinsic, SIMD? Maybe we could use ISPC, which is a uh, 
different language that manages the SIMD and um, those those commands for you. What if you added GPU acceleration? So you're doing a software rasterizer on a GPU, which is funny, but it actually kind of would be a lot of fun because you're doing a lot of the code translates well, even if it's not going to be super fast because you're not using the dedicated hardware, you know, it's, it's still going to be able to take advantage of the massive parallelism and floating point units on those GPUs. But more in the vein of features that are visual that you could element, not just speed, you could have cube maps and do a skybox with it. You could have point shadows. Our current shadows are one are very limited in that they are a direction, and if you're lighting multiple things, you're not going to cast a shadow behind the light, and if it's a point light, that's not very accurate. So you could also add directional, not directional, uh, proper spotlights that point in a direction and have a fall off like a flashlight would. Uh, one smaller thing that'd be fun to add is emissive textures. Our current model just has a diffuse, a specular, and a normal map. Um, but an emissive map allows you to have, you know, glowing eyes, a, a lantern that glows, and just other other fun things that are hard to do with a, a point lights. One fun thing that I always makes things look uh, looks makes graphics looks better is particles and particle effects having little sprinkles and twinkles and fireflies floating around. Uh, post processing, it's always always good to have you know having a bloom or some sort of anti aliasing so that you can create less jagged edges and more smooth uh, glossy uh, surfaces not glossy surfaces of uh, um, surfaces that well, bleed, so to speak. Um, one fun thing would be to write all of the logic in actual OpenGL or DirectX or Vulkan or Metal or whatever, or WebGL, and have a difference, have a, have a mode in both software and in hardware. That way you could see just how different or how fast the uh, modern hardware, modern GPU acceleration is, or software, modern rasterization acceleration is compared to doing it yourself. That'd be a fun comparison to see because our, our, our rasterization algorithm is something that makes sense but may not be the most optimal. What, what, what's the difference between that and uh, a hardware rasterizer that's have 20 years to develop an algorithm that's blazingly fast in hardware. That'd be cool. And of course, we're talking about software rasterizers. Just implement Quake. It's old game, great game, and you you know, if the game has a software rasterizer, why not try to recreate that in your own? I mean, it has binary space partitions, it has, um, what is it called? Uh, palettes so that you can get different colors rather than RG, pure RGB. So that's, that's a fun throwback. Uh, another thing is, is just having uh, some, there's, there's a lot of really cool things in Quake that you are fun to implement. If you need a reference, I highly recommend the uh, Black Book by Fabian Singlard. He has several articles on the rendering of Quake 1, 2, and 3, I believe, that are very useful if you're trying to re-implement all the effects. And so that's everything I have. Thanks for listening to me today. And, you know, that, this is our graphics programming virtual meetup.